General, share with us uh, what you recognize as your greatest failure and, and what you learned from that experience. Well, my greatest failure goes back to uh, when I was a, uh, a PM for, at that time, a lot of uh, electronic warfare systems. And uh, we were taking a particular system through a test. Uh, and the test was taking place down at Fort Huachuca. And um, I remember as a, a lieutenant colonel there, this was my first big job since being a captain. Program manager. Program manager that I was in charge. And we were about to go into a test of an operational system. Now, at those days, the test community essentially went off in, in their own little secret room, uh, devised this uh, rather devious test to, to ensure, if you will, some failure in the capability. Um, and so we didn't really find out about how this test plan was going to be until about 48 hours before the test was going to go. And so my initial concern when I first heard how the test was going to be conducted, I said to my team afterwards, and we, we talked about it, he said, look, we, we got less than a 50-50 chance to pass. He said, uh, you better call the general and talk to him and tell him that we can't do this test. And I'm thinking to myself, I can't call the general. I called the general, who at the time was General Brigadier General Bill Campbell, who ultimately became a three-star. Uh, in fact, I'm kind of his successor a few times afterwards. I was fearful of going back and asking him for help because as a young lieutenant colonel, I felt asking for assistance was indicative I was not competent enough to do the job. So I didn't ask for help. We went through the test. We failed. So at the end of the day, a few, a few months after the test and the test plan was put together, he called us all in and wanted to know what happened. So when the test community walked through the process, the test, the test plan, and so forth, he said, well, for crying out loud, no kidding, it failed. This is not how you're going to operate this capability in the field. And he looked at me, he says, you know that? And I go, yes, sir. He said, so why didn't you talk to me before you did this test? Oops. No excuse, sir. And so I learned very quickly then that asking for help is not necessarily a sign of or indicative of being incompetent or incapable. In many cases, it's recognizing your limitations about what you can and cannot do and seeking out assistance when it makes sense. Jeremy, excuse me, if that's your biggest failure, well, I, I say biggest failure, I mean, I think of it as the initial failure that really set me on a course to think more differently, if you will, about being a leader uh, and what leaders were. Because here I was, a lieutenant colonel, fearful of a general, uh, fearful of asking for help. Uh, and it cost the government at that time, of course, this was uh, early 90s, um, this was about four or five million dollars because the test was pretty expensive. And uh, subsequent to that, as I have gone out and talked to the pre-command courses for signal and, and in some cases the signal officers and the battalion commanders, brigade commanders, and as well the program managers at the Defense Acquisition University, I keep telling them one of the more significant things is don't forget to ask for help. Asking for help is not indicative of being incapable or weak or stupid. No, I get it. You know, that's the point. So, I mean, early lesson, early learned early has sort of paid benefits over time. Uh, would you name for us one or two of your heroes and why you hold them up as heroes? Sure. So I guess I have about three, if you don't mind. So the fir first one um, is my father. I mean, my father was a hero, um, taught me in many cases that balance in life is important. Uh, he taught me as a leader. Um, he was an executive at the time for Amoco, which is now British Petroleum, that uh, when you go on vacation, you go on vacation. And if you can't stand by, you know, being trustful of your folks or being um, trustful that they'll do what they're supposed to do, that you have to continue to check on them, then you haven't done your job. Because if you can't make sure that they do what they do when you're not around, then you're not, you're not a good leader. So that was, that was what I got from my father. Um, as well as the balance, the balance being, you know, take a knee, take a break. You don't have to be... Uh, on tap 24-7, 365. The second person I would say that kind of influenced me was uh, a guy named Woody Goldberg, Major Woody Goldberg. Um, he subsequently left the Army. He was a professor of mine at the Military Academy. Left the Army, became Chief Staff for Al Haig when Al Haig was the Secretary of State um, and has had a very successful career. But he taught me in many cases because of what he did to challenge assumptions. Challenge assumptions. Never listen to exactly what people think's going on. Ask them 
over and over again, why do they think what they think to get to the penetrating part of, you know, the facts so you can make decisions? Because at the end of the game, as he always told me, you're going to make a decision in some, you know, degree of uncertainty, but it's going to be based on some understanding of facts, whatever those facts are. You're never going to have perfect and in, in perfect facts, but you're going to have to have some understanding, and you only get that through challenging assumptions. And I think the last person that I really hold in great, great regard was when I was a major in the Army. My first program management job was a, a program called the All Source Analysis System, otherwise known as ACES. And the program manager at the time was General Bill Harmon, who subsequently became the PEO, Program Executive Officer for what we now know as C3T, um, Computers Command Control Tactical. And uh, as a one star at the time, um, I worked for him there as a major. And I, I saw what he did with respect to his engagement with people. It didn't matter whether you were a junior NCO or a two or three star general. He treated them exactly alike with respect, with dignity, and with integrity. And uh, the way he operated in terms of those particular values, I took to heart because at the end of the day, you know, he could go home at night and he could sleep. No matter how crazy things got, he, he, he could sleep because he maintained those values um, consistently. And I, I think, uh, you know, I learned a lot from him just watching and observing how he dealt with people. And uh, so I think uh, I always held him as a hero as well. Well, General Sorensen, thank you very much for joining us again. And I want to thank you for your service to AFCIA and, more importantly, your service to the country. This is Fred Francis for AFCIA and Signal Magazine. <laughs>